What's up guys, how you doing? Welcome to another video. So, straight in at the beginning, this video comes with a public service announcement. And by that, I mean it is a warning that it's a pretty long video. The idea of today's video is it's not just so much a regular one, it's a little bit more of a um, a lesson, a tutorial, um, almost like a, a course really, because we're gonna be talking in an awful lot of detail about Lightroom. So, if you're not prepared right now, to sit down for a slightly more lengthy video go take a bit of time get yourself a nice strong coffee get yourself a cold drink if it's hot outside relax kick back and when you have got some free time enjoy the video because i think you're going to find this one really really useful and you will learn a hell of a lot about lightroom so after doing a couple of mini videos about lightroom i thought i wanted to do something a little bit more in depth and a little bit more involved now i am by no means an expert in lightroom but fortunately Fortunately, I know a man who is. <laughs> a good friend of mine, Tony, uh, is a wedding photographer and actually we're very, very lucky that he shot mine and Mrs. Samble's wedding back in 2012. And that's actually how I met Tony, or I met him a little bit before. I didn't meet him on the day. If ever you guys are choosing a wedding photographer, I recommend you meet them before. Don't meet them on the day. And really, since then, myself and Tony have been friends. So I thought I would get him involved in this video. Now, obviously, he's not a sports photographer. As I mentioned, Tony is a wedding photographer. Tony Hart is his full name. I recommend you go check him out on Instagram so you can go see some of his work. I'm flashing out some of his pictures right here, including the one earlier of myself and Mrs. Sambles. Obviously all these photos taken by him and he really is an amazing wedding photographer. So on a side note, if any of you guys in the UK or around the world are looking for a wedding photographer, I really, really recommend you check him out. But for today, we're not talking wedding photography specifically, we're talking Lightroom. Now, I've been wanting to expand my Lightroom knowledge all of the time, and I consider myself to, to understand the basics, but I'm by no means an expert. And actually, what I thought I would do is take some advice from Tony. I thought I'd get into Lightroom, I'd get onto a Zoom video conference call with him. Obviously, we're having to do this remotely at the moment, you can't meet up and be in the same house, so we're doing it online, and I thought it'd be great to bring you guys along for the ride. So we're gonna dial in in a second to Tony. He's gonna talk us through some Lightroom stuff and I'm sure you guys are gonna learn loads. Really recommend sticking around for this one. Right, let's get dialed into Tony so we're ready to go and we are gonna learn some stuff about Lightroom. I'm looking forward to this one because I think I'm gonna learn loads. Before we dial in guys, make sure you go hit that like button for me. Take a second, it takes two seconds of your time. You hit that thumbs up right down below. And if you haven't subscribed, make sure you do. Go hit that subscribe button. It takes one second and you can see loads of other videos coming really soon on my channel. Right, let's dial into Tony and let's see how he's getting on. Hey man, can you hear me now? Yeah, I've got you. Hey. Perfect. Nice one. Nice one. How are we doing? You good? Yeah, not too bad, mate. Not too bad. Um, yeah. Okay. So, hello, everybody. Um, really good to be with you today. I've been invited by Rob um, to have a bit of a chat to you about how Lightroom works. Now, this is specifically uh, Lightroom Classic. Hopefully, uh, for those of you who might be new to Lightroom or or have you know limited experience with Lightroom. What we're going to do today is kind of have a bit of a chat about how we do things, work through um, sort of a, a basic workflow, looking at kind of import, a bit of developed stuff, um, and then at the end of things, how, how we kind of spit files out the other side and say, right, we've got a finished job. Yeah, hopefully it'll be it'll be quite useful. So let's jump into it. But what we're going to start with is is basically just a, a really quick walk around of Lightroom. So uh we've created a new catalog here that's not something i'm going to go into in this video but uh this is broadly what lightroom will look like when you fire it up for the first time um the key thing to notice is this bit up in the top right hand corner where we've got library develop map and so forth these are referred to as different modules inside lightroom and basically each module is kind of uh focused on a specific part of the process so it's fairly logical in that you start on the left hand side with the library stuff and move towards the right. Um, most people will only use library and develop for, for most of what they're doing. Uh, and today yeah, that's what that's we're going to That's about as far at. as I tend to get. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I do. Well, and, and print. I use print. I jump down a few. But yeah, yeah not, not too much more. I used, I used print for the first time in, in Yonks yesterday and I could barely remember how to do it. So <laughs> thankfully I'm not going to try and tell you anything about print today. So. Um, what we're going to do is start by just pulling in some images. Uh, these are 
30 or so images from a recent wedding I shot. Um, and, and what we're going to do is just kind of get a sense of how we how we do this. So let me take this back to the very beginning. So uh, we're going to come and click down in the bottom left hand corner. You'll see this little import button it does what it says on the tin, essentially. Click on that. And that will bring up this new dialogue. What this dialogue is, uh, is essentially on the left, you've got your source and that's where stuff is coming from. Uh, it's basically uh, on the Mac, your Finder or, or Windows Explorer on the PC. In the middle, you've got the pictures that you're going to preview in a minute. And on the right hand side, you've kind of got where they're going to within Lightroom and how you want to pre-process things or rename them, that sort of thing. So over here, we're going to go and find the, uh, find the images I've prepared so on the desktop. And they're these ones, Lightroom tutorial sample images. So we'll click on that and it will show us a, a quick preview of these images. Now, up at the very top of the screen, there's some useful stuff. Um, my, my Zoom thing has just popped into the way, so let me wait till that disappears. There we go. So we've got copy, move, and add. We can choose essentially how we're going to manage these images. Um, we can take them from where they live and we can literally copy them to somewhere else as, a light, as part of our Lightroom catalog. That's what I always do, just creates a, a sort of a backup on your system. Um, one of the things with Lightroom is you're never editing the original file. You're always um, dealing with what's known as meta, metadata or metadata, and that's instructions that are applied to the original file. So maybe we want to brighten this image up or we want to turn it into black and white. And the benefit of that is that it keeps your underlying file safe. However, as a wedding photographer, I take that stuff very, very seriously. And I always like to have multiple backups. So the first thing I do is I copy images into my Lightroom catalog. I'm never moving them or adding them. It's always copy for me. That just keeps things a bit safer. Um, so all of these have got checks against them, which tells me that they're going to import. Uh, it's very easy if we wanted to exclude an image. Um, so there's this one in the top right. I, I didn't mean to add that to this tutorial. So we're just going to click on that and it goes dim down, which means it's not going to come in. So then develop settings, you can apply certain develop settings on import. Some people like to uh, remove chromatic aberration is a common one. Some people, you know, boost all of their exposures by half a stop, whatever it might be. I, I don't work that way. I like to just have the untouched file essentially. And then uh, it's quite the interesting that what you what you touch on there, Tony, because obviously, so it could, quite a lot of the sports stuff um, mm. when I do it, and and pr probably quite a few people actually who, who who will watch my channel doing the sports stuff. I I've talked in a few of my videos about how I use presets in that section. So yeah. so like if I'm if I'm doing an event like you know at the side of a football pitch, I I will have it so it kind of does almost like the basic edit. So for, you know for sure. me it's. Uh, just, I mean, we're talking very tiny bits, like a tiny bit of vibrance, little contrast yeah. here and there, and the stuff that I know I'm then just going to do on 95% of the images anyway, uh, yeah. so so that I can just, because it, it's all to do with me being quicker, quicker, quicker. Uh, obviously, yeah, it's, definitely. It's, it's much less accurate than, than obviously what, what, what you're going to do for for, um, for a wedding, but it's, yeah, yeah. it's interesting. interesting. I think it's, I think that's definitely something worth flagging up that, um, Lyrum is a complicated tool and you can use it in many, many different ways. Uh, there's normally more than one route to the end result. And um, it has to be said, there are, there are wedding photographers out there who are much faster editors than me. I sometimes consider myself to be pretty laborious when it comes to, comes to editing. But um, yeah, that's not what I'm going to try and tell you about today. So, so then we drop down to, to destination. This is key. This is where we're sending files off to be and we are going to save them onto this uh, external hard disk I have called Hypercar. Um, and they're gonna go into this tutorial catalog that I built earlier. And then all we do is we just click import and we wait. Here we go, right, so we, yeah, we've nice. loaded these in and it's now building one-to-one -one previews. If I double click on an image, it makes it 
nice and big for me. If I hit the, the right key on my keyboard, it moves me along to the next image. Um, and what we have at the very bottom of the, of the screen is known as the film strip. This is just a, a chronological uh, presentation of your images. I say chronological, but it actually depends on how you choose to filter things. So this will be really important for you, won't it, Rob? Like particularly with sports work. Mm, yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, and I've I've always so I I always organise everything by um by the time it was by the time it was taken, basically. So sure, as, especially if I'm using two cameras, which obviously mm -hmm. you, you you do as well. So um so so that you know because sometimes with key moments, I did, like if someone scores a goal, I'm literally yeah. <laughs> photographing them coming on the long lens. And then yeah. chances are, as they get closer, I've quickly switched to the to the more wide angle, and and then so I take those your... photos in order when I'm when I'm trying to tell the story of of the goal. You know? <laughs> so, yeah. Definitely. So having your camera clocks synced perfectly is is key. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, always, I always check that because it's, it's funny how quick they they go out of sync. You know, I find even just a couple of weeks, and they seem to have creeped by a few seconds here or there. So yeah, yeah I, I, I'm, I'm always syncing those. I, I get that. I do. I, I sync my camera um, clocks before every single wedding. And even if it's a, just a week apart, I find, you know, a couple of seconds of creep. And yeah. I just think, you know, Canon can make these amazing cameras or Sony or whoever you shoot with. I'm like, <laughs> yeah. they can't build a clock for love nor money. Um, it always blows my mind. Um, so anyway, back, back to Lightroom. So first thing we're going to do is just kind of select which of these images we want to work on. Now, for me, in an actual wedding workflow, I don't come home with 28 images, um, I wish. I come home with, you know, 3,000 images, and I use a program called Photo Mechanic that any of the sports photographers will be very, very familiar with to yeah. whip through um, and, and do a first cull. Let's just, just do, some, do some culling. So the way I do that is I jump into, into the full screen view, and then I literally use the arrow keys. And if I remember rightly on the keyboard, it's, it's P, which is um, to flag an image and U to unflag it. So yeah. I like this image. Uh, I pressed the, the P key and you'll see it came up on the screen and said flag. And this little, in the very bottom left-hand corner, this white flag has come on. I'll show you on the next one. So we'll move on, P, and it puts a flag here as well so we'll just toggle between that so people can see um, so what we've done is we've selected a couple of images and we're going to come back to gallery view um, we can do that by clicking down here on the little uh, grid icon or we can press g there's a uh, a useful little uh, <laughs> shortcut that i do know off the top of my head uh, so the next thing we want to do is we want to filter these images we kind of don't want to see the ones that are uh, uh, not pertinent to us right now. So we want to just show the, the images that make sense for us. And so what we're going to do is, is choose attribute. And that's just, you know, does it have a color flag? Does it have a rating? Does it have a pick? And we're just going to choose our, our flag picks by clicking on this left-hand symbol. And that just uh, brings up the 16 images we've selected. Okay, guys, so let's, uh, let's jump into this image. So we've, we've double clicked on it, which has made it nice and big. But you'll notice if we look up here in the top right, that we're still in the library mode. And we, we're interested in developing now. So what we're gonna do is click across to develop. Okay, so this, this image um, was like a fun image from the, from the morning. Uh, this little one was absolute cutie pie. Um, and, what we what we had was obviously a pretty brightly lit scene on the left but quite a darkly lit scene on the right now i my focus was obviously her uh and i just wanted to make sure that that we got her with with a decent exposure but i want to balance things up a little bit here i want to make the bride who's the who's the lady on the left of the screen uh, a little bit more visible a little less haloing around her um probably want to increase the the uh the I want to bring the crop down a little bit on this image. Uh, what else would I so probably just punch up the what we call the dehaze, which is basically um, it's sort of a, a kind of uh, contrast that comes into effect when things are very backlit. Um, so let's just just get started. Really, the first thing I would do with an image like that is I would apply a preset which I pre-built. Um, so 
it's been a long time since I've actually looked at what my presets do quite honestly so we're just going to come over here and we're going to roll around so you'll see I've got these um, ATHP primaries so Tony Hart photo primaries and these are basically my basic starting points for any image um, I only got a couple of colors and a couple of black and whites and then a couple of sort of special case uh, presets and for an image like this the color jab soft is probably where we want to start because as I roll over that you can see it's just pulling back that highlight a yeah. good place to look would be in the um, in the sheet or whatever it is over the girl's head when you roll yeah. over that you can just see that some details coming back into that so I click on that and all of these sliders on the right hand side have just moved all over the place so we're going to just sort of shift between um, those two settings just focus on the right of the screen where you've got all the sliders you can see that all sorts of stuff is being changed to arrive at that point um, so let's talk through the, the develop module everything that you really care about is on the right hand side uh, and typically you'd work largely top to bottom um, one of the first things you want to look at is the profile I tend to like Adobe Color. I've made some adjustments recently, which is why it's popping up as Adobe Standard. But Adobe Color tends to have just a tiny little bit more punch to it. Um, and I find it just works better as a starting point for most images. The next thing you might want to think about doing is just messing around with, uh, with your, your temperature, your white balance, and your tint. Now, I'm pretty happy with the white balance in this image, but and if you keep your eye on the temperature slider, as I rotate that, you can see I'm making some changes there. This white balance becomes a matter of personal preference the moment you start talking about it. Some people love warm images. Some people hate cold images. I'm quite into what I think of as a neutral image. I'm not the sort of photographer that does very bluey images. I'm also not the sort of photographer that looks at ev like every wedding he's ever shot was on a sun-kissed day. So there'd be people who'd start up here and feel like that was the place to be. But for me, that's, that's just too warm. Um, likewise, there's some people who love everything with like a little bit of a green, green hit shade. And I'm overdoing this here just to show what I mean but there'd be yeah. some people who'd sort of consider something like that to be a good starting point as it happens I'm, I'm pretty happy with the white balance here so what we're going to do is we're just going to reduce the exposure I'm doing this with my loop deck so you won't see me dragging the slider but I'm just pointing to where, where we uh, where we're working as you can see we're coming down a little bit um, now what I want to do is open up the shadows for this section here. Um, just going to give the, the shadows wheel a quick twizzle just to show you what's happening. We're adjusting specific parts of the image. Another thing that's very useful is just understanding, you know, how an image breaks down in terms of highlights, shadows, whites, and blacks. At the very top in the right hand corner, you've got this histogram. Most photographers will have some awareness for histogram. But if you, if you move your cursor over the histogram in Lightroom, it will actually show you this section on the far left that is handled by the black slider. Next, this section is handled by shadows. Then exposure is in the middle, although technically kind of exposure pushes the whole of the image in one direction or the other. And then highlights as, you know, a bit brighter. And then the whites as the absolute brightest tones in the image. So it's, it's useful, for example, knowing the difference between highlights and whites. If you're dealing with something that's maybe the back of this uh, bride's um, dressing gown, that might be a highlight. But if we're talking about, you know, this area in the window or, or this very, very bright section of the, of the duvet, that would be a white probably. Yeah. No. Have, you, have you got any questions at this point, Rob? No, that's good. I think, yeah, exactly what you're kind of, you know, what, what you're explaining. So I think that's, that's a key part of it, right? Especially I, I find a lot of, uh, you know, the, the highlights and shadows is normally something I end up tweaking on a lot of images and especially, yeah. um, especially when I'm doing outside stuff, the, the worst mm -hmm. is when you do, you know, you're doing, dealing with, so looking at sports for a second when you're dealing with like half a pitch in the shade and half of it in the sun sure. you, what you get is, is typically someone has crossed over on the halfway point of those two those two areas right you're trying to take the photo so 
yeah, I, yeah. End, I end up tweaking those a bit. So no, that's good. Perfect. Definitely. I think the other thing to say is that uh, learning the develop module is it's a bit like learning the piano. It's it's yeah. not something that happens overnight. Um, and to anyone that's new to Lightroom, I would say please don't be afraid of of just jumping in and and twiddling stuff about yeah, because that's it. you know it, it, that's how you you kind of figure out what stuff what stuff does. Um, it might be useful just to to very briefly come down the the list of of options on the right hand side. So we, we've sort of discussed white balance. Then you've got these tone controls. Those are just overall. Um, sort of adjustments to, to the brightness of the image or specific tones within the image. So yeah. not looking at color or anything like that, just simply whether we're dealing with a dark or, or light part of the image. Presence, this is kind of how much sort of punch um, and bite the image has. Uh, over time, they've added more options in here. It used to be that, uh, you know, I didn't think they even had presence originally, and then gradually they added clarity, dehaze came next, texture came next, and they all do slightly different things. But if I, if I just, um, on my loop deck, I'm gonna stick up the clarity, and you can see we get this sort of very gritty effect. Um, personally, I loathe that, I think it's horrendous. But, you know, small amounts of it, great yeah. stuff. Or if we, if we zoom into an image, you'll see the cursor at the moment is like a little magnifying glass. We zoom in somewhere, um, maybe on this lampshade, and then we come over and uh, have a fiddle with the texture. Um, you'll see that suddenly we, it might be quite hard to see on the web, but we're just adding a bit of, bit of, bit of sort of bite into that texture. And yeah. sometimes an image can, can look great, but it's missing something. The eye really likes something to grab hold of, and and textured one of those things I find you know if an image is 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 too sort of soft like this uh you know it might work if it's sort of a, a dreamy image but for the most part a little bit of texture helps so I'll bring yeah. that back up nice. tone curve is just another way of of dealing with the tones in, in the image I'm a big believer in the way you make an image look great is by making subtle adjustments in lots of places um it's very rare that you can come in and just sort of twizzle one thing and, and yeah. get the best out of an image um, and obviously you can just keep going for as much time as time allows but you know you've got to call it somewhere Rob you on the side of a sports field probably have you know at best a couple of seconds per image yeah yeah not long at all no like I said it's yeah. usually that I do that preset on it and then I sure. um the, the, it's actually the bits you kind of you know it tends to be the exposure the the highlight shadows sometimes yeah. I'll need something specific like you know Pat, I don't know for whatever reason the colors are, are a bit dull or um a lot of the time it's what it's jpeg so the white balance mm -hmm. stuff is obviously a lot more restricted but you can sure. still so long as long as there's nothing major you can still slightly tweak the temperature of it if I need to um yeah Definitely. You know, just try, just try and do it very quickly. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. That's an interesting point you make about white balance. So um, you, you, every photographer is different um, and it, it obviously breaks up a little bit on what sort of field you're shooting in. Uh, for, for me as a wedding photographer, um, I shoot fully manual nearly all day, but I'm, I use also white balance. Uh, there are photographers out there. The, the chap who shot my wedding actually is a major exponent of uh setting your white balance for every situation um wow. now the reason i don't do that is because i find that white balance is one of the most changeable variables in any yeah. given setting so in this room that we're looking at now if i moved over towards where that mirror is on the left hand side of the room and shot into the room my white balance would be completely different yeah completely different and so i don't find that it's a particularly useful thing for me to be able to say right i'm in this given scene my white balance is you know 5600 yeah. kelvin or whatever i find it much more useful to um to adjust that after the fact and leave that section of my mind free while i'm shooting for you know a bit more compositional cycle or, or you know whatever it might be yeah um, i wish it's auto white balance yeah definitely yeah yeah thank god for that eh? that makes life easier <laughs> So uh, coming on down, we get to, to the point curve. Um, this is one of the real quick fixes I find. Let's just put this back to linear. So linear basically means that this line, which runs from the 
uh, shadow region all the way up to the to the very highlight region of your histogram is completely flat. What it's doing is it's not applying any um, sort of gain to one end of that or the other. And what it means is you end up with a with a flatter, more linear image. Now there are times when that's exactly what you want, um, but sometimes it ends up looking a little a little flat, a little lacking in punch. And really, we all want our images to to be compelling and one of the ways they can be compelling is if they have the right level of of contrast so um, my default setting is medium contrast on the point curve and that just makes everything just a little bit more grabby if i was shooting you know in fog or something i might be i might be after that kind of ethereal effect but that might be the one of the few times i might consider popping up to strong contrast yeah. In this setting, strong contrast is just too much. Everything starts to fall apart. Sure. Uh, then we get onto HSL. That stands for hue, saturation, and lightness, or luminance, rather. And uh, basically, it chunks up the image into a, a range of different colors, the reds, the oranges, the yellows, and so forth. And it allows you to individually moderate how much saturation you have the specific hue within each of those. So I want the reds to be a bit more orangey or I want the reds to be a bit more uh, tending towards sort of pinky, magenta hues, and then how bright each of those things are. I'll show you in a bit how we use that, but um, that's just what HSL does. That's it. Yeah, that, that's an area I need to get so much more. Like, <laughs> I mean, I, I, I know what it does, but I, my, my confidence with it probably isn't great. So I tend to, I normally tweak like, you know, the really obvious things. Like, you know, if it's, a, uh, if I was photographing a bright red car, I'll maybe go in there and play around with the reds, but not, mm -hmm. yeah, I don't use it much. I don't use it too much. Well, we'll come on to that in just a second. So mm. split toning, we're going to ignore for now. That it's very powerful split toning. I use it, um, I don't know, maybe on 15, 20% of images, but uh, it's it's fairly complex stuff. We're not going to hit that today. Yeah, sure. Detail, lot, lots of people bang on and on about sharpness settings. Um, I have to say, I don't mess around with sharpening very much. Largely, I leave things exactly as they come in, which is these settings here, 40 sharpening, radius one, detail 25, masking 20. Uh, you know, if an image is desperately soft, there are things that I might do to it if I want to recover it. But for the most part, I'm just going to leave that fairly, fairly as is. Again, with modern cameras, don't really need to worry too much about noise reduction. Um, what do you find as a, as a sports photographer? Do you, do you mess around with noise reduction? Yeah, um, I I used I used to more than I do now because um, back when I was using my 7D, the the noise needed a little bit more um, kind of management, I suppose. But I don't. No, I don't. I don't do much now. Sometimes when I'm when I'm photographing darker venues, I I I'll do some, but yeah, not massively. Like most of the football stuff I do, uh, especially if it's outdoors or um, maybe if it's at night time. But then again, if if I'm using the 1DX, to be honest, it's pretty good. So I. N normally I don't need to mess with it at all definitely I, that actually brings me on to a, a point I would make as, as almost the number one thing I would say to anyone who is serious about getting better in um, photo editing whether it's Lightroom or anything take your image whether let's say you're adjusting exposure or um, contrast is a good one let's say you're adjusting contrast take your contrast to where you want it to be and then roll back just a touch from where you yeah. think you want to be. Because it's so easy to just end up with everything. And it, as soon as you apply lots of edits that, take, that go slightly too far, you switch back to your original, your import image, and you go, crikey, my image looks better as an import than yeah. it does as an edited image. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's true. And you think, I've wasted all this time here. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, don't overdo things, guys. Um, that's a good way to almost learn each of individual slider as well. Almost, you could almost go through Lightroom and mm -hmm. literally with every single slider one at a time, just move mm -hmm. it all the way to one end, all the way to the other end. And you, you can you almost start to learn. You know, that's yes. certainly what I did when I was playing with Lightroom to start with is I literally that's kind of how I even if I didn't understand the technical side of it, I was able to understand well that slider does this if I move it all the way that way it does this if I move it all the way that way and and, and exactly. where does it look best you know definitely definitely because because good editing is about tiny adjustments but sometimes you can't see what you're doing until you wang the slider all the way one way or the yeah. other transform this is 
sort of more manual uh, versions of the controls we saw above. So we can kind of tilt yeah. the image. Um, you know, we'd never do anything that drastic to it. So we'll just we'll just undo that for the time being. Um, effects. This is this is largely like whether you want to add a bit of grain or whether you want to uh, sort of mess around with a with a vignette. Now, all of my images have some degree of vignette on them, but I like them to be quite subtle. It just it's basically just the darkening at the edge of the frame that helps bring the eye into the into the middle of the frame or, or really wherever the the subject is. Um, Calibration at the very bottom, very, very powerful. I use this a heck of a lot. I'm not going to go into too much detail about that today. Um, if you guys have questions, fire them over and I'll be very happy to, you know, either myself or Rob will be very happy to, to answer those, I'm sure. Uh, but, but calibration is hugely powerful. A bit beyond the scope of today's video, though, I think. Yeah, 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 definitely, yeah. So we'll, we'll, we'll hop on from, from this image and we'll, uh, we'll go and play with this one because... We were talking a minute ago about uh, hue, saturation, and lightness, and what we can do with with that. So, this was just a. Uh, I love how casual the bride is here. All of her mates are in um in their dresses, and she's still <laughs> still in her dressing gown. But, um, so what are we going to do with this image? Well, the the first thing we're going to do is similar to before. We're going to come over and find find this color jab preset, which if I roll on and off it, you can just see it's just just punching things up a little bit. So we'll apply that as a starting point. There's before and after settings that you can use in Lightroom and you can set them up in all sorts of different ways. So I, I have um, a button set up on my mouse to flip between the before and after of an image. And what this essentially does is it shows me what was my import image looking like and what is my edited images looking like. And the reason I have this is because I literally want to be able to see whether I've made the image better. And that sounds like a silly thing, but there are times when much as we were discussing earlier, you can push things too far. So this is, uh, when, I, when I select the before version, you'll see in the bottom left of the screen, it says before, yeah. and this is the, the after image. Now I have it set up to just show the whole image as before and after, because I find that the easiest way. You can come down here and click on where it says YY, and you can choose like a, a left right version or um, a split where where you've got sort of a, a line in the middle but most of the edits I'm making are pretty subtle and so rolling from one to the other is useful so let's mess around a little bit with the uh, hue saturation and luminance first of all I'm just going to give this a quick crop just so we can focus in on what we're doing uh, the way I did that there's a toolbar up on the right hand side and I clicked on this first one, which is uh, sort of a dotted outline, and that's the crop tool. One of the ways you can use hue, saturation, and luminance is to deal with skin tone. Uh, and I find that really useful because um, I imagine when you're shooting, shooting football or basketball, people care very little about skin tone. <laughs> yeah, I, tell, I tell yeah. you, brides, brides care about skin tone. So. I bet they do, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So essentially, most um, Caucasian skin tones, at least, uh, operate in the sort of orange palette. And we have, um, we have four girls here with a, with a range of skin tones from, you know, very light, uh, sort of quite a, quite a pale skin tone for this girl in the middle to more olivey with the bride. Um, but this will apply to kind of all of them. So we're going to come down to hue, saturation, and luminance. And first of all, we're going to hit luminance. And this is going to allow us to punch up the, the brightness, essentially, of individual channels. So if we come and click and drag on the orange, you can see that we're just we're brightening almost selectively the yeah. skin tone. Yeah. And we can we can darken it down. No one wants to look like that. They've had a horrendous spray tan. It's the end of, <laughs> it's the end of days. Um, but if we use it moderately, we can achieve quite good things. So. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this on the loop deck, but just keep an eye on the yeah, orange cool. luminance slider. Um, we're just going to bring this up a, a touch, say to like plus eight. And then the other thing we're going to do is we're going to bring the, the saturation down a touch. So we change over to saturation, bring the saturation of the orange down just, just a touch. Um, maybe, maybe a little bit more just so it's nice and clear. And then we're going to show the difference between this. So if we scroll down on the left-hand side, 
after you get past all your presets, you get to your history of, of actions that you've applied to this mm. image. Yeah. And so we can snap back to, well, I've got crop rectangle, which was the, the crop we did before we made these adjustments. And just keep an eye on the skin tones now. We're gonna change from before to after. And those skin tones now just have a little bit more pop to them. And hopefully you can see, can you see that at your end, Rob? Yeah, 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 you yeah. can, yeah, you can see the change, yeah, nice. Yeah. So the skin tone was, was great in this image, but it's a, it's a really useful tool. There are certainly times when, you know, someone's just looking a bit flat and they, they look like they need a bit of sunshine or they, okay, let's move on and fiddle with another image. Um, uh, th this is a nice image that doesn't need a huge amount done to it. So let's just uh, give it a really quick edit. Um, all we're gonna do again, come over here and we're gonna see what, see what works really. We can apply one of these presets. I find that the soft preset just takes away a little too much contrast. It makes it flat, frankly. Um, whereas whereas the, jo the jab preset just brightens everything up a bit, makes it feel a bit more like we were in the room. We're gonna then crop the image and we clicked on the crop tool, just rotate it a bit. I'm obsessive about having um, accurate uprights. I hate it when things are slightly mm -hmm. off center. And yeah, that's, of... that's big in sports too, that making sure your horizons are level. Definitely. Is it? Yeah, is it? I yeah. didn't know that. Wow. Yeah, 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 it is. Yeah, we always do. Like I've been doing some like image critiques on my, on my channels and so much of what people send in, uh, the, I'm always talking about getting the horizons level yeah it, you know it's and, and like you say with uprights obviously sometimes if you're shooting maybe at an angle across the pitch you couldn't yeah you couldn't literally level the horizon otherwise the the goal post would be at a, a 45 degree angle or whatever so yeah it's if you if you don't have a level horizon then yeah you're working to the uprights exactly like yes you're yeah and that that's a really good point because um i find if i'm ever torn between working to the horizon or an upright the upright is where you go um yeah. If if you're if one of them has got to be off, it probably be better that your horizon is slightly off and your uprights look look half right reasonable. Um, yeah. But it, it depends on how far out of whack everything is. Um, so so we're pretty happy with this image. Uh, it's maybe slightly overexposed. So I'm um, keeping on the exposure slider. We're just going to bring this down a couple, and then I want to open up the shadows a little bit. So we're going to be working on the shadows here. Just open them up just a touch. Uh, and yeah, pretty happy with that. So again, we're gonna switch bef between before and after. Um, that's our before shot. It looks pretty good. But our after shot's just got a bit more punch to it. Yeah. Um, there's all sorts of, as you'll see, like nothing's pushed too far in any direction. Everything's just a small adjustment. Um, but those things add up. It's there interesting when you said like, because what you're saying about the smaller adjustments, like what, what, what you've done with, with that image there when you go into the before and after, that the change is, is, is actually really small. Like when you look at the before and after, there isn't a huge amount that changes, yeah. but, but it unquestionably looks better with what mm -hmm. you've done. Just those small tweaks, 100%, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I'm a big believer that, you know, there's, there's a lot of wedding photographers, particularly out there, have a very, very stylized look. Um, mm. You know, they, they might end up with, if I just sling on something more stylized, so, you know, they might end up with something that's that's a bit more like, like, like this maybe. Yeah. yeah, and, there's the, yeah. and there's nothing wrong with that. You know, lots of people. There's there's no right or wrong here. It's a matter of personal preference. Yeah. But for me, I worry that that an image like that may date, and may end up just looking a bit, a bit of its time. And I don't really want wedding pictures to do that. Um, so yeah, for me, it's mostly mostly subtle stuff. Um, there is something in this image that annoys me. Uh, <laughs> I hate smoke detectors, <laughs> fire exit signs, all that stuff. Um, frankly, it's probably me being obsessive. But up here, there's a there's a smoke detector, and it just it just annoys me. So it's the easiest thing in the world to get rid of in Lightroom. Mm. Um, you can come over and this second tool next to the crop tool. Um, is the spot removal tool and just on your mouse scroll wheel you can increase the size of it yeah uh, you can do that also over here on the slider and this feather just adjusts how the edge works 
you've got two options, clone and heal. Clone will basically pick up a bit of image from somewhere else and put it directly on top of the thing you want to get rid of. Heal will do essentially the same, but it will try and match the edges so it blends in. So most of the time I, I live in the heal element. Yeah. And all we're going to do is we're going to click here and it's gone. It's, it's gone. And we can change where we're pulling uh, our, our sort of uh, healing element of the image for. Now, like I say, in this, in this picture, it's a pretty minor thing, but it's a useful tool to know about. You can use it for, for yeah, anything. Yeah, that's handy, definitely, yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, next image. So we've got a, we've got a fire exit sign. Don't, don't, don't like it, so we're gonna come and grab the, the tool. You can also, if you click and drag with the mouse, you can do shapes of any, any description. Yeah. So it doesn't always have to be a circle. So that's picked it up from somewhere ridiculous, the corner of the suit. <laughs> But if, if we move it over here, uh, that's yeah, nice. no one's really going to spot that that was there. You could yeah. go in and do another job around the edge, but let's be honest, it's, it's a case of what's enough. Um, okay, so this image, this was the one we were talking about earlier. This is going to be black and white. And the reason it's going to be black and white is there's no good light here. They've got crappy down lighters. Um, I've underexposed the image. That was that was photographer fail. Um, <laughs> it happens. <laughs> so we're going to come and use one of my black and white presets, and we're going to start with the, this one called dark scenes, which I regularly use for, unsurprisingly, dark scenes. So we click on it, and we're starting to get somewhere, but we're still miles and miles away. First of all, this vignette is way too heavy, so we're going to take the vignette off. Um, I use quite a complicated vignette that's made up of all sorts of different bits and pieces. But we're going to initially start under lens correction and just pull this vignette off till it's almost completely gone. Next off, we just need to increase the exposure quite a bit. Now, all my black and white images uh, have a massive push on the exposure, normally 1.5 stops at least. Wow. And people are really surprised when they, when they hear that. But yeah. I pull back a lot of other stuff. I pull back the blacks, for example. Now, we were talking a minute ago how, you know, I don't like extreme edits. I tend to be a little bit the other way with black and white because okay. the, and the, my thinking around this is because black and white is, by its very nature, a stylized thing. Yeah. Um, we don't see in black and white. We're choosing to go, this image would look cool in black and white. So, as you'll see, I've got a 1.68 push on the exposure, a 77 pull on the blacks. There's all sorts going on. So the first thing that's really, it's really interesting because because a lot of a lot of your I always admire your black and white stuff. I think it's really good. So that that's interesting that you that you've done like you know that because I I can't imagine I would ever be bumping in exposure that much when I've turned an image to black and white. So that's could obviously I mean I can see what you've done with the blacks for example. So that's that's really interesting. There's probably another whole video in, in converting black and white somewhere down the line, I would imagine. Uh, oh, yeah, my days. I could get chatting about black and white. So <laughs> rather than doing that, I'm going to show you, I'm going to show you, this is more of an image recovery type yeah. situation. You know, yeah. there's a good image in here. They actually, when I sent them their previews, this was one of the images I sent as a preview. And I think this was the third image that she posted to Instagram. Like there's a oh, good wow. shot, shot in there. They're, they're chuffed, but yeah, yeah, the, nice. um, so, so what we're going to do is we're going we're gonna to boost up this exposure a little bit more. Um, I'm on the 5D Mark IV. If you do, you know, tank a shot like this, there's a lot you can do to pull it back. So um, because it's already a dark image, we don't need all this, this um, pulled black. So we'll, we'll pull up the blacks a bunch. And then we're going to lift up the shadows, which is going to do a lot with sort of face areas and that sort of thing. Yeah. Now, my presets have developed over the years and Lightroom has changed over the years. So you will notice that up in the top, top right hand corner, the treatment still comes up as color. Mm. Now, there was a time when Lightroom didn't have a black and white mode, if I remember correctly. And the way you turn it black and white is by pulling the saturation all the way down. Oh, okay, yeah. Te technically, this is still a, a color image. I can pull up the saturation. Oh, but, okay, okay. But these days, I tend to flick over to the black and white treatment, changes things ever so slightly. Um, now, this would be a good place to use the tone curve. The darks, we can recover a bit of the darks in here. And so that the image doesn't look too flat, 
we're going to push up the lights a bit too. And we're starting to have an image which, you know, has some credibility about it. I, I'm pretty happy with that. I could work on it much longer, but I'm pretty happy with that. And we'll just switch be between before and after. No one wants this. Hey, we're looking wow, pretty cool. Yeah, nice. Um, and then we might just crop it down a touch. Just get essential on them. Get rid of this stuff on the on the right hand side of the frame that was in the image. So let's say I'm complete with this image. There's something I do when I finish every single uh, image I, I edit, and that's I make a snapshot of it. And that's just over here on the left hand side. What I do is I click this plus button and I call it produced, and that's my finished version. And the way, and that's really useful. So let's say, you know, let's say you want multiple versions of an image or multiple looks to an image. You can use that snapshots function. So let's say we wanted a color version of this. Uh, I'm very quickly going to make this a color version. I'm going to just uh, sort out that temperature a bit, sort out that tint a bit. I hate this image as color, but um, we're going to now go to snapshots and call this color. And this is another way that you can just switch between two versions of an image in, in quick fashion. Nice. Uh, okay. So let's go and do maybe a couple more images and then we'll do some export. How does that sound? Cool. Yeah, that sounds good to me. I think what we're going to do is have a play with with this image, which is in that same corridor we were in before. Oh, a complete, cool. completely different lighting scenario. Uh, so this is dance floor. It's quite a small wedding. They only had 50 or 60 guests. Um, and the bride loved the dance floor. So regardless <laughs> of whether regardless of whether there's anyone on there with her, she was going to boogie. Now <laughs> There's definitely a cool image in here, but uh, at, at the moment, it's not quite there. So we're going to jump back into develop. Uh, first thing we'll do, obvious stuff. I hate this. We're going to have to move this fire exit sign. Boom, it's gone. That took, that took me literally no time. I yeah. could have gone round to Photoshop. Would have been a waste of time. So people often ask what this little tool here is. I don't know if you can see this just next to the temperature slider. Yeah, yeah, you can. Yeah. This is the, the white balance picker tool and it's really useful for, for a situation where the white balance is off. As it turns out, the white balance is quite good here, but let's, let's say the image came in, came in like this. It's a bit cool and a bit cold. Nothing looks quite right. We grab the white balance picker tool and just click in, Ideally, a neutral bit of what I would call sort of dark white or gray. So this area, which is shaded on the dance floor, that will get us a little bit closer. And you can play around, try the edge of her dress. Oh, that's nice. That's pretty close. Um, and sometimes when you're way out of whack with your white balance, that's a useful way of just, just honing in a bit. Um, now, other things I might change about this. There's this person who's actually at the bar. I don't know if you can see this if I brighten it up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, in the person shadows, at the, yeah. Uh, at the bar, who's just dragging my eye away from, away from the bride. So what we're going to do is apply one of these presets that I regularly use. We'll, we'll apply the punch preset. And what this is doing is adding a, a fair bit of vibrance and saturation to make these colours more interesting. It's uh, pulling down these blacks in this area of the image. Uh, and you know it's a starting point so we're going to make some some changes the other thing it's done is apply a vignette which is on all of my images and the moment that happens we start to lose track of this person at the bar which is yeah. what we want the next way i'm going to remove this person at the bar is with just a little graduated filter this is the fourth tool across in the right hand toolbar uh just above your your basic tool panel yeah and this allows you to, to drag in an adjustment and we're going to pull out an adjustment a bit like that. And then if you come down to this bottom left area next to paste, you can decide whether you want to, to see or not see the filter lines, which is really useful. Um, so sometimes you want the filter lines out of the way to see what the adjustment you've made is actually looking like. So we've turned it to never. Okay. Yeah. And we won't see the filter lines. And now we can just darken by pulling on this selective adjustment, the exposure in this area. Yeah. 
Nice. And if we just pull it down a touch, pull these shadows down a touch, suddenly that elbow that was in the frame yeah. is just disappearing. And no one's going to notice that an adjustment's been made there. It just looks like it's an area that's just in a bit more shadow than the rest of the image. Yeah, absolutely. Nice. Um, okay, so we can deselect that uh, graduated filter. And we'll just do a quick jump between the before and after. Again, a, a fairly subtle change, but we're just darkening down that corner of the frame and drawing attention into the bride. But the bride's still a bit dark. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna brighten up selectively on the bride. And we're gonna do that with a radial filter. And that's the next one along in the toolbar. Click on that. And this basically creates a circle. So we're gonna drag this out over the bride. And then we're going to pump up the exposure a little bit on the bride. But specifically, we're going to pump up the shadows for her back, just to bring her back into a bit more light. And the highlights, not too much. A little bit of whites, just to make her dress pop. Nice. And yeah, that just, makes a difference, doesn't it? That's just, it really yeah. does. So that's, that's, the, bef uh, that's the before, uh, and that's the after. Mm. And because we've blended these things well, you're not going, oh, look at that massive halo around her. She yeah. just appears to be in good light. Some yeah. of that's because she's lit, like there's, there's flashes around the dance floor. Yeah. Um, but yeah, there's all sorts we could do. There's this little bit of haloing going on over here. We could sort that out. But essentially, we're in a pretty good place. But again, we can just do the before and after on this. Uh, before, not, not a bad shot, but you know, there's an idea there is the point. But then we're yeah. getting to, to it being closer to, to the image we want. Okay, so I've got a group shot here. Uh, the way group shots work, they're, they're a funny thing in a wedding. So everybody wants them, but no one wants to take the time to do them. Totally <laughs> understandably, everyone wants to, I was the same on my wedding day, everyone wants to just have a party. You don't want to stand in a line while a photographer does his thing. And frankly, most, most photographers um, find them the, the most... I don't want to say challenging part of the day, but the most, um, the, in some ways, they're the biggest drag on a wedding day. In the, yeah, it must be. It becomes a little bit about people management. But uh, <laughs> the way I, I do group shots, I try and work very quickly, and I, I do light all my group shots. So this is lit by, um, obviously, natural light primarily, and then there's a flash, which I think in this image was camera right, and that just helps me get a really nice exposure that, that has a bit of separation from the background on it. And even on an overcast day like this one, this was a wedding in March, it helps, helps things feel like there's a bit of drama and a bit of pop to them. And yeah, also, nice. if you're going to do, if you're gonna do a, you know, a, a group photo, you've got to do it well. It's got to look smart if, you, if you're stealing people time-wise. Um, Okay, so the first thing I'm gonna do with, with a group photo is do, frankly, as little as possible. So we're gonna go and just whack on the, the jab preset, which we've used a lot, and that just gives everything just a oh, bit Oh yeah, of, that's, yeah, you can see the difference there, yeah, the green we, especially. If we do a before and after, um, you, can, you can see that. And then there's, there's too much space in this image, so we're gonna crop it down. Now, something I use when cropping, and I've actually had to sort of stop using this because I've moved to the loop deck and it's driving me nuts, but I'm gonna show you guys, is if you press the L key a couple of times, it does a mode that's called lights out. Does that yeah. show at your end? Yeah, it does, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, I wasn't sure if that would work over Zoom. And I find yeah, this no, incredibly useful for, just for seeing the edges of the frame really clearly and understanding how things, how things balance up. So that's about where we want to be. Um, we'll, we'll complete that crop and then we'll press L again to bring everything, everything back to full lightness. Now, with a group shot, this, this is the sort of image I, I really care about detail because this is going to sit on someone's mantelpiece. And so small adjustments matter to me here. Now, the first thing I do when I come in and look closely at the image is the skin tones are slightly too green. Um, so what we're going to do is we're just going to come over to the to the tint 
and we're just going to increase the tint a touch, keeping an eye on specifically the bride's face. This will be hard to see, but it's, it's going to change things just a little bit. So we've increased the tint by seven points or so. Uh, and if we jump specifically between the before, that's slightly more green, to after, things are looking a little bit more neutral in terms of skin okay. tone. Yeah. It's going to be a hard thing to see, but it, it's the sort of thing that makes a difference. Um, and then, yeah, we're, we're pretty much done with this image. I might just crop it ever so slightly more just, just to balance things up. Um, okay, okay so, so we've got a few images that we've, we've dealt with and let's, um, let's now export those images. Uh, we're going to select, select them all. And the way I do this on the Mac is Command A. I believe it's Control A on the PC. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, it is. Uh, um, and then what we're going to do at this point is we're saying these images are done and we want to take these edited raw images and make an image that's useful for sharing with people. So that'll probably be a JPEG. And come up to uh, the menu bar at the top, click on File, come down to Export. Now, I have all sorts of export presets, um, but let's start with a sort of a basic one. Um, and what I want you to do is ignore the stuff under preset and just pay attention to this export section on the right. This export location, much like when you're importing, this is just saying, where's the file going to end up? Choose folder later is incredibly useful because it allows you to build presets and then, you know, every time you use that preset, you probably want to stick the files in a slightly different place. You yeah. may want to, or in a different folder. And this will ask you after the operation to export is complete, what folder you'd like to pick. Sure. So I, I've got it on choose folder later. File renaming. This is, um, I actually tend to rename my files in Lightroom. Uh, but you can yeah. rename them on export. So let's do that now. We'll rename them to custom name with a sequence. We'll call the custom text, um, you know, Rob, Rob and Tony, Rob plus Tony, uh, underscore Lightroom edit. Uh, file settings. Might want to compress these down a bit. So we'll go qu quality 80 is plenty good enough. And then we might want to resize these images. Uh, say, let's make them 2,500 pixels on the long edge. Sharpening, sharpen for screen, low. Again, sort of whatever works best for you. Uh, everyone has their preference. And then when we click export, it will ask me where I want to export them. So the last folder I exported into is my exported for Instagram folder. But we're going to stick them in this folder I use a lot on the desktop called Photo Import Export. I'm going to call these uh, Lightroom Tutorial Export JPEGs. And we'll hit Create and we will hit Open. And in the top left hand corner of the screen, you'll be able to see the export occurring. Nothing will happen for a minute and then it will do them all at once. Um, so it's pinged open this folder in my Mac OS finder and these are the, the finished images. Um, and we can, you know, send them off to the client or in a sports setting, send them to a picture desk, whatever it might be. Yeah, uh, that's it. Uh, and that's kind of, kind of the end of the process. Um, nice. And there we go, guys. I hope you enjoyed it. I did warn you it was a longer video, so thank you very much. Those of you guys who've stuck around until now, I love you guys. Thank you for sticking around to the end of the video. You guys are the hardcore, and I appreciate you for being part of that group. If you did enjoy it, make sure you hit that like button for me. Make sure you subscribe if you haven't already. If you've got any follow-up questions, and I'm sure there'll be a lot of follow-up questions for something like this, Tony's already told me he's going to help me out answering some of those. So hit your questions up in the comments below. As I said earlier, make sure you go check out Tony on his Instagram page. You can follow it right here. You can go see some of his work. An amazing wedding photographer. And as I said, I really recommend you guys check him out if you're looking for a wedding photographer anytime in the future. In the meantime, guys, thank you very much for watching from myself and Tony. I will see you guys. I will see you 
on the next video.